So I'd like to give you a very warm welcome. Uh, we've been really encouraged by the, you know, the real interest in the session tonight. I can see over 84 people in the call. I know many more were, were very keen to join, but just weren't able to join us. First of all, I would like to give uh, an enormous thank you to Stafford and Lithgow uh, Academy for agreeing to share their journey with us tonight, their journey to develop a more holistic approach to the BGE Secondary Sciences curriculum. Uh, we're really uh, keen, we were really keen to work with the school to bring in this session because we know that many schools are looking at the BGE just now and looking at ways they can improve it and develop it further. Uh, and in bringing you the session tonight, I think we're really keen to emphasize the school's very much still in its journey. This is not a, a sort of finished product, as it were. They'll give you a very honest account of the approach they've taken over the last few years. Uh, they'll give you a, a sense of the challenges they've encountered along the way and the challenges that remain. But I hope you'll agree that sort of sharing practice in this sort of very open uh, way, uh, in very practical way, is really valuable. And for us, this is this is very much about creating a strong collaborative learning system. Uh, I think one where we have the space to try new things and to learn from our collective experiences. And for us, it's really very much about working together to improve outcomes for all of Scotland's young people. And I think for those of you who were involved last year, that was very much the same spirit that we worked collectively with secondary science teachers across Scotland at the height of the COVID pandemic. The secondary Sciences Network showed a great leadership and professionalism in the way they responded to the challenge. And for us here in the secondary, uh, sorry, in the STEM team at Education Scotland, I think the real highlight for us last year uh, during lockdown was having the chance to work really closely with secondary sciences teachers. And through that partnership working, we were able to generate and share some 5,000 resources to support remote learning. And all of those resources are now available through our national e-learning offer website. So the leadership uh, and a sense of collaboration that the secondary sciences teachers showed last year, uh, you know, was really instrumental to the success of the national e-learning offer. So in Education Scotland, we wanted to build in this uh, culture of collaboration uh, with a really strong focus on the BGE secondary sciences curriculum. Why BGE? Uh, for a number of reasons, we're entering into a period of curriculum reform following the OECD review. Uh, they highlighted issues around sort of uh, the balance between knowledge and skills and four capacities. Uh, and so that there's sort of further development work needed there. But we also need to do more to encourage learners to progress into science and STEM pathways. Uh, we've supported improvements in primary science in a number of ways through Education Scotland's Early Learning and Child Care and Primary Science Network, and also through a RAISE programme, a Raising Aspirations in Science Education programme. I know we've got a couple of RAISE officers with us tonight. So the RAISE programme's operated in 20 local authorities so far. And for us, we really wanted to build on that momentum and enthusiasm and interest in science that we're starting to develop at primary school and to see how we can continue that through a BG secondary and into the senior phase. And I think obviously this session is coming to you during COP26, obviously a very exciting moment for, for Scotland and the world, where we've got a big focus on climate justice education. Uh, there's you know mentions of biotechnology and artificial intelligence. We've got nationally and globally, you know, anti-vaxxers trying to, uh, you know, put messages across about vaccines and, and, and you know, and sort of potential dangers around that. And I think, you know, more than ever, we understand the importance of making sure our learners have a really solid grounding in science and the BG science curriculum is really, really fundamental to that. So our intention really is this webinar is the start of an ongoing conversation, an ongoing piece of work around the BG this year, hopefully in partnership with many of you. And we're very keen to work with you in any way we can to support this improvement. So we've created a Padlet for tonight's session. We'll put that link in the chat shortly. Uh, please use this if you have any questions, points, suggestions for us uh, during or after the session. Uh, and just click on the plus sign below each of the heading section in the Padlet to ask uh, to add any comments. I can see uh, Janie's put that into the link already into the chat. So, a uh, warm welcome. Uh, I should have said at the beginning, my name is Ian Menzies, if you don't know me. I'm the Senior Education Officer for, uh, for Science and STEM Education Scotland. I'm joined by some of my colleagues tonight uh, from the STEM team, Jenny Irvin, uh, Margaret Crow, uh, Mary uh, Thompson is with us as well, and maybe some other colleagues. Uh, so, a very warm welcome. And what I'll do just now is I'll hand over to Craig Byers and the team at Linlithgow uh, to lead us off. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Linlithgow Academy Science Faculty. Um, I'm sitting here in um, our one of our study areas, uh, and I'm here with the rest of the team. And throughout this evening, what we're going to do is we're going to um, share with you our journey so far um, with the review of our BGE Science course. Um, initially, we're going to talk about S1 and S2, but towards the end, we're going to move on a little bit, and we'll maybe tell you a little bit about what we're doing in S3 at the moment. Um, so what I will do just now is I will share my screen, and as long as that, hopefully that should work without too many issues, um, and you will see, hopefully now in front of you, um, if I just share the screen now, excuse the little box at the corner of the screen there, um, you can see um, I've called this uh, presentation BGE Science, Our Journey So Far, because as Ian said earlier, it is still very much, um, and uh, I, I, we're still learning from what we've been doing over the last couple of years, um, and we feel that the last couple of years haven't been great with regards to the interruption in learning and, and COVID and all the kind of mitigations gone on there, so we haven't fully given the young people the experience that we would like to have done when we set out in this journey, but um, we are absolutely delighted to be speaking to you tonight and sharing uh, some of the lessons that we've learned. So, um, first of all, I'll introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Craig Byers and I'm the Principal Teacher of the BGE Sciences in Linlithgow Academy, and I'm joined this evening um, with David Roger, who is the PTC of the Sciences Faculty at Linlithgow Academy, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about how we audited our BGE and how it, um, and the lessons that we learned for planning the, the new curriculum. Um, I'm also joined by Rosa Fernandez from our chemistry department. She's going to talk to you a little bit about the work that she did with um, our local cluster primary schools and the challenges that she identified and how we were able to uh, deal with those at the start of our new BGE course. Then Nicola Stewart from our biology department is going to talk to you a little bit about how we came up with our thematic groupings uh, and how we shared uh, ideas collaboratively as a faculty come up with um, something that we thought was um, quite good in terms of the local context or for the young people, but also enthuses them uh, with regards to their skills for life, learning and work. Then, unfortunately, Fiona um, from our biology department, who cannot uh, be with us this evening, um, she was going to tell us a little bit about um, non-specialist teaching and curriculum development. However, Nicola and Andy, who is going to come after Nicola, um, they are going to take on her part and they're going to share a little bit about what she um, wanted to share with you. And Andy is going to tell you a little bit about Andy Donaldson, sorry, from our chemistry department. He's going to tell us a little bit about our assessment strategy within the units, both formative and summative, and what we're going to look to do going forward with monitoring tracking in the BGE. And then uh, to round things off, we have Louisa Burgess from our chemistry department who's going to talk a little bit about what we've identified as our next step um, and how we're going to uh, further the skills and the uh, careers development agenda um, across the whole school. Uh, and then um, Time permitting, hopefully, uh, we can address some of the Q&A um, that come up in the Padlet um, this evening. So, I am just going to get us started, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where we were at the start of our journey. And in essence, the, the biggest issue that we had um, in our uh, BG course B 2016 was that our um, S2 pupils went into discrete sciences, um, which wasn't so much of an issue if we had S2 pupils who picked all three sciences. However, um, the narrowing of that subject choice in S2, sometimes only two periods a week uh, in science each, some young people were getting, meant that we weren't fulfilling the entitlements of the level three uh, science experiences and outcomes identified by building the curriculum three. Um, so that became an issue. And what we had to do is we had to come up with a new way to deliver our S3, um, sorry, our level three um, uh, science experience and outcomes and make sure that we were fulfilling that entitlement. But one of the other issues was that that early choice was limiting future choices for our young people in the senior phase. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to maintain and improve on some of the numbers, um, particularly in uh, some sciences more than others, and also try and redress the gender balance or gender imbalance, I should say, that, uh, that kind of went on in some of the senior phase sciences. Um, and finally, um, many of the resources and lessons that had been uh, used around about 2016 were possibly um, kind of maintained from the previous 5 to 14 curriculum. Uh, there wasn't, um, in some cases, there wasn't uh, an opportunity to take into um, re-evaluate and reshape what we were teaching the young people. So we felt that it was an appropriate time to uh, make changes. And uh, David is going to talk to you a little bit about what we learned when we audited the course as it was in 2016. 
a um, little bit of kind of background reading um, before we started the planning process and um, building the curriculum three, of course, and um, that, as I mentioned earlier, talked a little bit about the entitlements that young people um, were, uh, were entitled to, but not only just through the experiences and outcomes, but also through the skills for life learning and work um, that the young people are entitled to and um, entitled to positive destinations. So what we wanted to do was build upon that and make sure that our new course um, fulfilled those entitlements. Moving on to building the curriculum four, um, what we got, essentially got from building the curriculum four was the idea that context is very important. Um, pupils needed to know why they were learning what they were learning, and we wanted to motivate and infuse those pupils by ensuring that the context for learning was clear and that the pupils could identify that. The developing the young workforce agenda, um, we wanted to increase the opportunities to engage with external agencies such as employers, universities, colleges, further education um, opportunities, and also um, embed a wide range of work-related learning and local context learning um, upon the, built upon the spirit of um, what we said from building the curriculum for. And then finally, of course, the National Improvement Plan, um, all about reducing essentially the poverty-related attainment gap. And what we felt, felt from that is that we needed a big um, articulation as much as we could between the skills required uh, for the senior phase and our BGE um, and to, uh, to make sure that we were um, building upon that. So what we did is we took, at first, we took the sciences, experiences and outcomes um, and we used those. And Nicola is going to talk to you a little bit later about how we grouped those together thematically. But also, later on, we had the benchmarks and sciences, which helped to um, address and provide what we felt was the national standard uh, and the standard that we needed our young people to um, meet within level three of the, of the BGE. As um, discussed, um, we uh, have provided a curriculum rationale um, and we wrote that as a faculty and we feel like it's a very robust document that goes into far, far more detail um, about the curriculum and the lessons and what's involved uh, than we can than we have time to do tonight. But the main um, sort of messages that we wanted to bring across from that is that we wanted to ensure high quality delivery of the science experiences and outcomes, first of all, on the third level in S1 and S2. And then moving onwards to S3, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were um, embedding ownership and buy-in of the new BGE science course, not only from pupils, but also from staff to make sure that all the stakeholders were involved in the planning process. As mentioned earlier, we wanted to increase and maintain pupil numbers in all the three discrete sciences in the senior phase. Uh, and one thing that we unfortunately don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this evening was the use of the moderation cycle, uh, the learning teaching assessment cycle. But what I would say about that is that the the, moder the moderation cycle allowed us to embed moderation activities and um, to ensure that all the all the staff and all the pupils knew what the understanding of the level was at level three um, and we also want them to self-evaluate their skills uh, and self-evaluate their knowledge so we provided them with a profiling booklet uh, that allows us to um, sort of evaluate what they think they know about the the, the units and um, that's linked towards the skills framework of the school. But also that profile and booklet um, is very, very useful for um, uh, helping to structure learner conversations. Um, and from those, next steps can be identified so that um, communication with parents can be made. Um, and it, it, it helps in the process of striking up conversation about uh, pupils and the progress that they need to make in their learning. One of the things that we were very, very keen to do right from the start was to make sure that all our new taught units were um, contextualised and thematic. Um, we had um, a meeting across the West Lothian Science Networks and Keith Varty, who is the uh, deputy head teacher at Inveraman Community High School at the moment, um, was um, quite helpful in signposting some um, academic readings for providing uh, contextualised and relevance um, in the science curriculum. Um, there's quite a few little um, uh, tidbits of information there, but one of the most important ones, I think, is that last one. Um, the use of the narrative form in science can teaching uh, can become a heuristic teaching device 
that it's not only attractive but also self-sustaining. And I don't mind telling the audience tonight that I did have to look up in the dictionary what heuristic meant, um, but heuristic essentially means um, just to discover or learn from themselves. So um, it was to embed a little bit of learners leading their own learning alongside providing them with a narrative and providing them with the, the answer to the question, why do I need to learn this stuff? So I would just like to put on record some uh, some thanks to Keith for helping us to signpost that learning. So to the curriculum itself. Um, in the curriculum rationale document that hopefully we will have a little bit of a read at at some point, it does go into a lot more detail about a lesson by lesson breakdown, but you can see on the slides there we have um, the six thematic learning um, kind of ideas that we came up with. Um, now, Nicola is going to talk to you a little bit about the process of how we came up to those. Um, but what I would also like to say is that on top of this, we also have a bridging unit, which Rosa is going to talk to you a little about. But also we have a careers bridging unit and we also have a topical science unit that aren't listed there. But again, in the curriculum rationale document, we'll be able to see quite a lot about um, what's involved in those. Now I'm going to kind of finish up my little introduction part by just talking to you a little bit about what we have learned very recently from the OECD document. Um, Ian mentioned earlier about the kind of imbalance of knowledge, skills and attitudes. I think that possibly we started off by trying to build our curriculum around about skills, but the OECD have kind of identified the issue that perhaps skills need to be based on a knowledge base and maybe that's something that we think we're going to have to go and look at. And we've also identified that we may well have looked too much at the benchmarks themselves rather than as a national standard thing, but rather as a kind of proxy curriculum. So we're evaluating that at the moment. Um, we have been looking at the national, transnational, local and school drivers, and we're going to try and embed a little bit more about higher order thinking skills, teaching pupils a wee bit more of the meta skills that are involved in skills 4.0. And at the moment, we are working very hard on a faculty improvement plan, which helps to provide a lesson structure that will help us to um, increase learner engagement by, in, by focusing around those higher order meta skills such as evaluation and analysis. And then finally, the, the reason that we are speaking to you this evening is because we got in touch with Education Scotland to ask if anyone had provided um, an idea of how to make the senior phase match a little bit more of the vision of the CFE and BGE. And at the moment, um, there isn't very much out there. However, that is something that we are absolutely delighted to work with other people with uh, in order to create something in the senior phase. So. Um, in essence, that is um, my little introduction part. Now, what I would like to do at the moment, okay, is I would like to hand you over um, to David, who is going to talk to you a little bit about the audit of our BGE um, going forward and how we learn some lessons from that. So thank you very much. Okay, I can't um, really see, sorry, my name is uh, David Roger, I'm the PTC Sciences at Long Musco Academy. Um, I can't currently tell if you can see me, like on your screen, so I don't know if I'm kind of central to, to what you're seeing. Um, I'm going to assume that the PowerPoint's still live and that you can see it. So just introduce myself again, I'm David Roger, PTC Science. And if we go back to 2016, I think it's important I say a few things about the context of the school and the context of the faculty um, before I actually kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of what we've done in our audit of our BGE. So we're a comprehensive school and um, we have about 1400 pupils at Olmothville Academy and we are in West Lothian, so kind of central belt in Scotland. Um, at the time back in 2016, the actual faculty itself didn't exist as a science faculty, so it was, it was a little bit fragmented. Um, if anyone's been teaching physics for a while, they might know Tom Balinowski. He was the head of maths um, and physics, and then you had myself who was head of chemistry and biology, and at that point, uh, the E's and O's had been published um, to schools and we were kind of in the, the midst of waiting for the, the benchmarks to be published and myself and Tom had a discussion at that time and we decided to kind of double down our efforts in the senior phase and put together our national five and higher and advanced higher courses um, and we very much knew that our, our BGE courses really weren't fit for purpose the way they were so we were still using level E and F materials um, and at that point we kind of just plastered over a few tracks so things like the the, the lesson on Scottish scientists, things like that didn't fit into the 5 to 14 documentation, but we put lessons in there um, because what we wanted to do was get the senior phase completed and actually give the, the BGE the, the time that it deserved. 
Um, and we felt that that should be quite a long process that we allowed staff time to think about it um, quite critically. So uh, moving on from that, um, Tom Balanovsky retired um, and they brought the sciences together. So they brought together chemistry, physics and biology. Um, I was appointed PPC and at that point we knew that was our kind of jump off point. So, you know, our, the thing that we were really going to get a, a stick into at that point was an audit of our BGE and putting something uh, new together, which Craig's obviously talked to you about um, at the start there. So for me, obviously, it was about enhancing the curriculum for the pupils um, and having, a, you know, we're quite senior heavy um, at Linlithgow Academy. So we present about 40 percent of the the cohort in S S5 for higher biology, high 20 percent, um, mid 30 percent for higher chemistry and higher physics. Um, so it's important that we have an engaging BGE and something that really, you know, sets the kids up with a solid foundation for, for studying in the senior phase. And we wanted that robust BGE course, but for me, I very much seen it as an opportunity to build a team um, within the science faculty. So it was fragmented, like I said, there wasn't, it wasn't anything to do with relationships. It was just the fact that there were different faculties from one another. Um, and when I was, you know, carrying out the audit for the faculty itself, I wanted to group staff together um, in a way that we kind of build that team ethos and allow people opportunities to lead within the faculty. Um, and it was also massively important to me that during the audit process, anything that we found and anything that we put forward, that every single person's um, opinion was valued and that we, we could engage critically and challenged each other with how we move forward. So I'm just going to move the slide on. Um, two seconds. Okay, so sorry, I should have actually shifted that on before I started talking there. I've talked you through the context of the faculty. So like I said, it was one that wasn't together as a science faculty. We didn't really have a very good BGE course. Um, it wasn't really fit for purpose the way it was. Um, and now I'm going to move on to talking to you about the kind of key features of the audit and, uh, and what we carried out and why we done it. And I've plastered the kind of the PowerPoint that's in the screen now with a lot of the important documents. So obviously building the curriculum one to five, uh, the benchmarks in science, and, and these were all documentation that the staff were encouraged to read in the early phases. Um, there's two, uh, it's actually three uh, different slides on there from Higios, so the challenge questions and features of uh, highly effective practice for both self-evaluation, um, transitions and curriculum. And they were three that we used in the kind of planning stage and ones that we'll continue to use to, to critically kind of look at how good we're doing things. So the audit itself, I, I don't know if Ian will remember, but back in 2016, I actually sent him an email um, because there was points of data I wanted to try and lift. Um, and I would say there was kind of three key themes that I was looking at in terms of the audit. Uh, one was very much about transitions. Um, I think we've done a very good job at the moment of looking at the transition between primary and secondary. Um, and Rose is going to talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. I think at the moment we're kind of working on, because we've just changed our monitoring tracking system at the school, I would say the, the transition between BGE and senior phase is something that we need to do a little bit more work on. Um, and I know that's something that we're going to be working on over the next couple of years. Um, the second thing was just actually establishing what we've done well. You know, with the, even though we were working from 5 to 14 documentation, there were still things that we knew that we'd done very, very well with the kids. And that there were things that, you know, they infused the kids and, and prepared them well for the senior phase. Um, and the third part of the audit was actually just looking at the kind of coherence overall of the curriculum. So how the science uh, curriculum would actually marry up with the rest of the school in terms of literacy outcomes, numeracy outcomes, um, and what they were learning in the other faculties. So um, going through the actual three points that I've said there, transitions, um, what we were doing well, um, and actually having a coherent curriculum, we decided to pick out the five things that are up on the, the screen at the moment. Um, and I'd emailed Ian my idea to make those things part of the audit um, that we've done with the kids. And he'd actually emailed me back and uh, agreed that he thought they were a good idea. But he'd also suggested a few bits more professional reading that we could undertake before doing the audit, um, which was well received. And I can share what they were if anyone's keen. And the five parts of the audit itself was the liaison with the uh, feeder primary schools. Um, so whether you're using uh, transitions within Higios or whether you're actually just thinking fundamentally when the kids come in in S1, are you treating them as completely new pupils who haven't gone through an experience from early, early level outcomes all the way through? And for me, it was really, really important that we establish links, better links with the primary schools than what we had. Um, but also in terms of actually building relationships with them, it was actually finding out what the base knowledge was of the kids when they came into S1. And again, Rosa's going to tell you a bit more about that. Um, in terms of the audit of the BGE benchmark, that I was coming from, and, and Craig's actually highlighted it as well, that they went into discrete sciences in S2. And what that caused within the faculty was people to very much focus on the outcomes that related to their science. So if someone, you know, they would engage obviously with the, the level three outcomes in S1 when the kids were studying science, 
But as soon as it then moved into S2 and S3 and it went to a discrete science, each of the respective scientists then focused on the particular outcomes that related to biology, chemistry or physics. So what we've done was we actually went through um, the benchmarks themselves. And it was just, a, for me, it was kind of two reasons, okay? It, it was to actually check the outcomes that we we're currently delivering and what ones we're going to be delivering in the future. But it was also um, to give the staff a kind of opportunity to look at how the early level outcomes progress through to the, the level four outcomes and then through to the senior phase. We put together a questionnaire. Um, something we learned from that actually was not to do it like old school. So there's a lot of kind of um, like survey monkey and you can also use forms and things like that now to pull that data. But at the time we actually done it on paper, um, which was a questionnaire that went to every single pupil in the BGE. So it was like 600 pupils or something like that. And the questionnaire had 20 questions in it. Um, and someone had to collate that information. And I think that was like a, it was like a massive job that um, we had to take the kind of points of data that came from that questionnaire to drive us forward. So. You know, I don't think anyone would make the mistake of doing it on paper anymore, but certainly utilise the ICT um, that you've got to, to reduce the volume of work that you've got to do. And the questionnaire itself was was it was designed around the kind of seven principles of design. So we had challenge, breadth, progression, and we had sets of questions within them that went out to the kids. Um, and what we were trying to establish at that point was it really was about what we were currently doing well and what we should maintain when we change our BTE um, and what things we would look to improve. Um, and I can share that questionnaire with you if anyone's keen to see it. Um, we did get a lot from it. You know, there was a massive amount of data came from it and we actually had to summarise the data to take a kind of mandate for the features that we wanted to include in our, our new um, BGE courses. We've done a numeracy audit. So we met with our um, the math teachers within the school um, and we looked at a kind of timeline of how they deliver certain things to the kids in, in S1. And um, that was important to us because you look at these kind of skills that we look to, to introduce to the kids in terms of averages or percentages and things like that that you want to teach them when they come into the, the BGE. And I think we, we had an unfair expectation of the kids in our old model about we would expect them to be much better at calculating averages and we would also try and teach them it in a way that wasn't coherent with the way that they would do it in maths. And ultimately what we've come up with from that is a kind of bridging unit, um, which I'll, I'll leave for, for Rosa to discuss to you. Um, but yeah, that, that was uh, very worthwhile doing the numeracy audit. And then the looking outwards, that was part of my email to Ian when I when I put the kind of facets of the, the audit that we were going to send out. Um, when I'd emailed Ian initially, it was about, you know, what do you think of the things that I'm wanting to include in the audit? And do you have any schools that I could go and see in terms of delivering BGE, any schools that are doing it in a novel way? And I won't mention any of those schools at the moment. Ian did reply to me with a couple. But actually where we get the most value was looking outwards in terms of school within the authority. Um, I've got to say a particular thanks to James Young. Um, who we took a lot of our inspiration from in terms of um, contextualised learning. Um, and Keith already mentioned, sorry, Craig's already mentioned Keith Varty, who um, we spoke to again about the kind of contextualised learning. So you imagine we've got those five parts of the audit. Um, and what you've got is a massive amount of data is going to come from that in terms of feedback from the primary schools, feedback from what the kids think we do well and what we need to improve, um, the staff skilling themselves up in terms of the outcomes, uh, numeracy in terms of what they were able to do in certain months in S1. Um, and then we've got kind of bits that we've seen from other schools that we quite liked. And what we've done from there was we took the findings from the audit um, and that obviously included the professional reading that everyone was engaged with. And I thought it was important to put a kind of timeline on this for you just so you can see what our experience was like. Um, I really didn't want to rush it because I wanted staff to have creativity in terms of kind of ideas that they would take forward. Um, and from the findings of the audit and the professional reading, that whole process took about six months. And during the course of that, we were having faculty meetings where the staff that were involved in certain parts of the audit were presenting at the faculty meetings. They were presenting their findings. They were prevent, presenting ideas, presenting challenges and possible solutions that they had to problems that they were seeing. And we took all those points of data and we basically came up with a summary. You know, here, here's what we're getting from the primary. Here's what we're getting in terms of what the kids' voice is and what they're saying to us about what we do well. Um, and we then set the, the staff off and the science faculty with, here is everything we've found. And I'm going to leave it for Nicola um, to talk about in a little minute. Um, there was then a, a task that came with that about how staff could then take the findings from that audit and how we could then push forward with what are your ideas for how you could um, deliver the BGE. And everyone had an opportunity to lead that. They had an opportunity to group things together and present to the faculty ideas. And I would just say, without taking anything away from what Nicola's going to say, we ended up with an amalgamation of everyone's ideas. And it was really, really good in terms of bringing the faculty together as a team. 
that task itself, um, in terms of people taking the findings and, and, and moving forward with that, was about three months. And then it was a kind of rolling process after that. So once we started to get our ideas of how we would group things together, um, et cetera, it was then a rolling uh, kind of project where we were putting together a new S1 course over an academic year for it to run the following year. And then during that time, we were then developing the S2 for those to follow the following year. Um, and then into S3 after that. I think that pretty much describes everything that we've done in the audit phase of it. There are lots of challenges that presented themselves that I probably don't have time to talk about. Um, but like Craig said, in terms of networking with other schools, if anyone's wanting to get in touch and, and challenge any of the things that we've done, um, I'm absolutely welcome to it. And, and as a faculty, we would probably like to get the links between other schools as well. So please do get in touch if you're looking for any more information about the questionnaire that we used with the kids, anything we found from any of the parts of the audit that we've done. So I'm going to hand over now um, specifically about the primary liaison um, and the findings that Rosa was involved in the team of staff that went out to the feeder primary schools. I'm going to pass on to Rosa to, to discuss that with you then now. Okay, thank you. Hi, good evening everyone. So I'm Rosa Fernandez uh, and I've been a chemistry teacher in Lilithgo Academy for over eight years now. Uh, so when we started thinking about designing the new BGE, we thought it was essential to gather information about what science outcomes we, uh, were covered in the primary schools at the FID uh, Lilithgo Academy. We have eight uh, primary schools in uh, Lilithgo Academy, and we sent an email to all of them explaining our plans and asking them if we could visit to discuss the science topics and outcomes they covered uh, during P5, P6, and P7. Six of the schools came back to us and we either gathered uh, information through email or we actually uh, paid them a visit and we had a little conversation with them and, and shared different experiences. Um, so, as we expected, we received a variety of information from the different schools. In this slide, you can see a very simplified summary of the information we collected. Uh, all the schools fitted one of these three categories that you can see. I'm going to move this a little bit here so you can see this one better. Yeah. Okay. So one of the obviously the, the problems with staffing. Okay. So not all the schools have science specific, specific uh, teachers. Uh, another factor was the, the confidence and knowledge of teaching science. Um, the teachers, so some were a bit more confident, some had a bit more experience. Uh, another factor was a school attainment. So some schools were more focused on literacy and numeracy, and obviously they didn't cover as much um, science as others. Resources and equipment available was obviously another issue. Some schools had uh, quite a bit of resources, and uh, many of them used phonics, which was a, a paper-based uh, resource, and they didn't like it too much, obviously because it was paper-based. Uh, others were using things like CERC. Okay, and finally, uh, the level of covering the L2 outcomes. So some of them, uh, they covered them fully, and they had a good plan, a good delivery plan in the school. Some others, they just cover some of them. Okay. Go to the next slide here. Okay. So what were our findings? Obviously, we were expecting some of these differences, uh, which, which confirmed to us that all the S ones we get every year in our classes come with different knowledge. Uh, and many of them would have not covered all the L2 outcomes. It was very important, of course, for us to bear this in mind when planning our course, our BGE courses, and uh, we wanted to uh, get it right for all the students, uh, independently for, from where they, they, they came from, from which school they came from, and which uh, outcomes they have covered, science outcomes they have covered. Therefore, we had some discussions, and we had to take some decisions, and we created a plan. Um, okay, so we can see in the next slide the plan of action. So we decided that we, even if some of the L1 and L2 outcomes might have not been covered, we were going to start at L3, level three outcomes, because that's what secondary schools uh, we were going to do. Um, we were going to check previous knowledge, and that was going to allow us to um, get a baseline of what the individual class uh, was able to do. One of the most important uh, things that we thought about it was uh, that obviously we wanted a good start for all the students in our classes and we designed a bridging unit. I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. Um, that was obviously a bridging unit from primary to secondary school. What things maybe some of them might not know, we would help them from the beginning and then they could would have a good, good start. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Uh, I'll go back to the previous slide because I've forgotten to mention that obviously uh, when we were having a conversation with the primary schools, uh, some of the um, staff in there they were telling us that obviously they would be love, they, they love to have us there if we could deliver some of the lessons and then could, they could obviously see what it was all about and they could replicate the lesson. So obviously if our timetable was uh, allowing us to do that, uh, we were very eager to go and see them. At the moment, obviously we haven't actioned this just yet because our timetable has been quite full. But that's something that we really would love to do in the near future. Uh, personally, uh, I did this in my probation year. I visited one of the primary schools, and uh, it was very enjoyable. Uh, the primary sevens, it was the ones that I, I, I saw. They were always excited, and it's actually quite nice because they, they get to see a new face as well. Okay. Um, finally, the last thing, uh, we decided that it would be very uh, good to actually have a transition project for all the P7s in collaboration with the primary schools. Uh, some of the departments in the school are doing it already. This is something that is in, in, our, in our plans as well. Okay, so to end my part, uh, I wanted just to give you a bit of a, an idea of what this bridging unit is about. Uh, so we, did, we do this at the start, when uh, as soon as the S1s join us, and we cover six areas. Uh, we start with the safety and hazard symbols, then we move to scientific language units that we use. Uh, we have a lesson on equipment, so they obviously they get familiarized with the equipment we use in the lab and where it is in the classroom and drawing 2D diagrams as well. Then we move on to variables and fair tests. Okay, so that's something that many have done as well in primary schools, but sometimes they forget and some of them maybe they haven't covered it fully. Uh, a bit of maths, so we did a bit of averages and percentages. Again, uh, because uh, some schools have not covered it um, fully, and because, again, maybe in the match lessons, they hadn't got to that point just yet, okay? And then we spent a few lessons on processing data. So, obviously, pie charts, bar, line, and scatter graphs as well, okay? So, quite a lot, but it's a good start for all the students. Finally, when we finished the bridging journey, uh, we created a formative assessment. So, this is a little experiment, a little practical that they do towards the end of, of the topic and they get the chance to uh, use all the areas one, two, three, four, five, six that we have covered in here. They get an opportunity to discuss uh, safety, to discuss the units that they've used for recording the data, and obviously use a, a kind of a scientific uh, method report with their diagrams and the method and the instructions, discuss the variables, which ones are uh, the ones that they change, which ones are the, the ones that they keep the same, and obviously at that point, we start with uh, the new course uh, and the new material, which they are quite eager to, to start with because obviously they want to uh, mess about with the chemicals and, and do uh, lots of Bonson burner, burner uses. Yeah? Uh, and that's really it. Uh, the bridging unit is something that um, we probably with time might vary some of the things and make it a bit more exciting. Because at the moment, sometimes it can be a bit too dry because it's not uh, as much practical, but we try to do practical as as much as we can to cover those topics as well. Uh, and that's me, really. Okay, so I'm going to pass you to Nicola Stewart now. At the end, if you've got any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. And Nicola is going to talk about thematic groupings and collaborative sharing. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, good evening, everyone. So I'm Nicola Stewart, um, and I'm a teacher in the biology department here at Linlithgow. Um, and I'm just going to take you through a bit about our thematic groupings and our collaborative sharing process. So after the audit, we knew what wasn't working with our BG course and our shortfalls. And we knew that we had the opportunity to create something which would give pupils a more engaging experience in science at Wilmoth School. So the process was started by giving all the staff and the faculty the BGE science outcomes. And we were encouraged to take these away and consider how we could group these together. These were printed on different coloured paper, as you can see on the picture there, and um, each uh, different colour for each science. And this was a really good visual tool just to allow us to consider a mix of sciences in the new units we were proposing. So uh, several ideas ended up being presented at a faculty meeting and staff were invited to critique these. And we were really, really fortunate that a number of um, ideas we could envisage working at Linlithgow. And so in the end, as Davis mentioned, uh, we decided on an amalgamation of ideas from uh, a number of people. And by the end of this process, we knew that we wanted to have 
units that had a theme to them and would have an overarching question or story which we could refer to throughout and incorporate into an alternative assessment at the end. And my colleague Andy is going to talk you through these a little bit later on. We then needed to create our units taking on this thematic approach. Um, and as Dave mentioned, he was liaising with the science faculty at James Young High School about what they were doing with their BGE courses. And they shared the title of their units and one in particular, Can a Lemon Power a Light Bulb? Up a cord with us um, and kind of got John, the is now yeah, exiting. We knew we could make an engaging unit encompassing lots of benchmarks from different sciences, which had a story we could refer to, um, and it would help to keep pupils engaged and understand the relevance of what they were learning. So Dave asked the staff at James Young High School if we could use the title only, um, which they kindly agreed to, and that was our first uh, unit theme. After this, we took the benchmarks and um, we decided how we could group them together in a similar way. And we worked in smaller groups to design and develop lessons within the unit. And we tried to ensure that these working groups were made up of people um, with different science specialties, and as well as a mixture of pupils with varying levels of experience. Um, and this really allowed us to have a lot of critical discussion around what people knew would work well from experience, as well as allowing fresh perspectives on um, how lessons could be approached in a new and exciting way. It wasn't all as easy as the initial unit, however, we found that as we got further into our development, it became harder to be imaginative with our ideas. The sort of benchmarks that we had to work with was getting smaller and smaller. So by the time we were developing our final S2 unit, uh, we found that we were just left with the few remaining benchmarks, which were actually mostly um, composed of biology outcomes. And at this point, we had to ensure that we were remaining critical and really questioning if what we were proposing was truly following our initial idea of this thematic approach or if we were just shoehorning it in to, to kind of get it done. Um, so it took a lot of teamwork and creative thinking, but we ended up with our final unit, which is now building a healthy human. So I'm just going to finish off by talking through one of our units just as an example, which is Sustainable Scotland, um, which comes at the end of our S1 course. And this unit aims to introduce pupils um, to some key ideas and vocabulary within the topic of sustainability while putting it in a relevant context for them. So with Linlithgow being surrounded by many rural areas, we wanted to centre the lessons around um, topics which they could relate to while introducing ideas about sustainable living. The entire unit is focused around the idea of designing an eco-village. So we started with introducing the pupils to some examples of eco-villages and communities um, within Scotland and the rest of the UK, and some discussion around how people can live in a greener way. And then at the end of the unit, pupils um, have to apply what they've learned and design their own eco-village. They can revisit that idea. Um, and having this theme has allowed us to cover quite a wide variety of science topics while referring to this idea of sustainable living. Um, and the table on the slide here just shows us all of the outcomes which are included in this unit. So we've got Scottish scientists, heat, renewables, photosynthesis, sampling, pesticides and fertilisers and chemical formula. Um, we know that this unit is going to continue to be one that we'll come back to to try and keep relevant and current with learning for sustainability being a national driver in shaping our teaching practice and what we expose pupils to and uh, advancing developments and technologies. It's going to be important that we tweak this topic keep it relevant in today's setting um, and within the faculty there's already plans to go in and make some stronger links to the sustainable development goals throughout the unit. Um, so as Craig said, our, my colleague Fiona Price can't be with us here tonight, so myself and Andy are just going to talk you through a bit about what she planned on, on talking to you about, um, focusing on non-specialist teaching and curriculum development. So using um, our S2 unit, Getting to Another Planet, as an example, this just shows you how the development is split across the faculty. Um, so the lessons on lenses were developed by a biology teacher. In this case, it was Fiona. Um, the lessons on optics was taught, uh, developed by a chemistry teacher and, again, digestion, another chemistry teacher, and then rates of reactions by a physics specialist. Um, and we really did this for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was to give everyone ownership. Um, so we all have an investment in the three sciences, not just our specialism. Um, so we thought we all should be involved in developing out with our special specialty too. It meant fresh eyes could be used for developing new and engaging lessons. So we weren't just doing uh, or teaching a lesson in a certain way just because it always has been. Um, and it gave us a lot of benefit in understanding um, what we were developing and making sure that we were pitching lessons at the right level 
So non-specialists could come in and teach it um, and find it quite easy to do that. And I'm just going to pass over to Andy to cover this next topic. Thank you very much. Hi folks, I'm going to be Fiona for one slide and then I'll go back to Andy um, for, for my bit. Um, just to kind of pick up from where Nicola left off, um, that idea that you've got non-specialist um, teachers developing certain units, um, there's obviously the three bullet points up on the slide. I think really what underpins them is the professional dialogue with your colleagues. Um, certainly myself being a chemist, um, teaching the lesson on lenses um, and talking a wee bit about refraction. Um, and I know, apologies to any physicists in the in the audience, but you're not allowed to describe the light as bending when it goes through a prism. Um, it's got to be about the light changing speed as it moves from one, one object into another. Um, that's something that I, if I hadn't had that professional dialogue with physicists, that is something that I would very, very easily, I, did, I know I would have said that to the pupils at some point. Um, and obviously, building on that in the senior phase at National Five and higher, that's going to cost the marks. So I think really just the idea that non-specialist teachers are developing other units, um, the professional dialogue is the thing that kind of underpins all of that. I think it's absolutely, it's, it's made me a better teacher, I think. Um, just to move on to my bit, um, which, as Craig said earlier, a wee bit about assessment and uh, monitoring and tracking, um, I just want to give you an idea as to where we were with our old courses and what we've changed and maybe some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of what it is we, we were doing and, and how we've kind of addressed them. So our previous courses um, were, I mean, the assessments we had was one summative test at the end of, of each content unit. Um, as mentioned before, they were kind of shoehorned in from the 5 to 14 curriculum. Um, they were very much developed, both the courses, the content and the assessments by subject specialists um, with particular fo focuses on the senior phase. Um, what we found is that some of these, when we actually go back and look at some of the questions we were asking kids in these summative assessments, uh, we used to have an S2 unit called Acids and Bases. And I think out of the 30 marks, seven or eight of them were um, asking kids about the pH scale it's just complete overkill. Um, asking them basically the same question, assessing the same piece of, of knowledge time after time. Um, what it also means is that the, we didn't really have an opportunity for, well, first of all, to do any kind of formative assessments unless you incorporate that within your lessons. There was nothing official at the end of a unit. Um, there was no chance to feedback and give the pupils any, you, you, you need to work on this bit. We'll do that. We're not going to visit that outcome again, and they might not visit again until they get to National 4 or 5. There's no opportunity for them to improve on it before then. Um, and also that assessment of skills, because it's a summative test, uh, you're kind of limited by what the kids can put down on a bit of paper. So what we've now got for our um, new courses, we have two assessments at the end of each unit. We have a formative assessment um, followed by probably about a week of revision and then a summative assessment. Obviously created um, from scratch from the BGE benchmarks. Um, as before, we have developed them across the faculty, um, having non-subject specialists in and developing questions for areas out with their own um, their own subject, which I think has made, again, all the all the staff here, we've got a better understanding of what's expected in the in the senior phase for each subject. Um, we have uh, obviously the questions themselves because um, there's a much wider variety of outcomes in each unit. Y your questions are, at, you feel much more focused. Um, Nicola's uh, slide a second ago with the, the kind of breakdown of that sustainable Scotland unit. Um, it's very unlikely you're going to hit any repetition in there. What that's also done by giving us the kind of formative and summative assessments, it's given us the kind of disadvantages from the previous one, you can see what the opportunities are at the bottom. We've now got um, a chance, because there's a gap between the formative and summative assessments, if there are any areas of development, we've got that week of revision to address them with the pupils. Um, the formative assessments, I'll give you some examples of what we do in a wee second, but we have found ways of assessing skills. Um, it's also just different ways that the pupils can demonstrate their knowledge. Not every pupil is able to get their knowledge down in a summative test. 
So giving them these different opportunities to show off their knowledge, we feel is um, helping their confidence as well. So the kind of structure of a summative test, um, I don't want to bore you with the kind of where we're getting the kind of nuts and bolts of it, but um, we're looking for roughly a 70-30 split of KU and PS, very similar to the senior phase assessments. Um, Rosa mentioned earlier some of the skills from the bridging unit. Um, we try and incorporate some of them, so getting the pupils to draw diagrams of apparatus, calculating percentages, um, working out averages. Again, it's something that from our own courses we assume the pupils could do that, and it's very clear from the assessment that they can't. That bridging units um, there to try and skill them up on these parts, um, which is definitely making a difference to their, certainly their numeracy. Um, we'll obviously, mirroring some aspects of the senior phase, just a list of things that you find in some of the senior phase assessments. Um, we're trying to put questions like that into our BGE, again, to give the pupils that familiarity with what they're going to experience in the sciences <laughs> in the senior phase. Um, like I said before, the non-subject specialist staff, I think the the professional dialogue between ourselves and um, putting these assessments together, um, it's definitely something that it's, it's, uh, it, it's helped people um, you know, have a better understanding of what's there in the other science subjects in the senior phase. I've put there except graphs. We've had many a debate at faculty meetings about what one's the right one to use, if it's a scatter graph or a line graph, or if it's a join the dots or a line of best fit. Obviously, as a chemist, joining the dots is a no-no, but biology seem to disagree. Um, but again, that professional dialogue that we're having, um, we would always have taught the kids in chemistry units, it's always a it's always a curve or a line of best fit, and that's not the case in biology. So that's something, again, that it's, um, we'll, as teachers, we're, we're becoming uh, more familiar with our science subjects. Um, just to give you a kind of... Uh, an idea of what we do with our formative assessments. Um, it's the six content units that we teach, the three in S1 and the three in S2. Um, there's a very brief, a very brief description um, in the middle column about what it is they're doing. You can see from the, the right-hand side, that's kind of what we're looking for the pupils to produce. And I'll give you a wee example of some of them in a, in a second. Um, there's obviously a big, big scope for assessing skills within there. I mean, you'll see things like presentation appears a number of times, and it's something that we're looking to um, looking for the pupils to develop those skills as they move through our, our BGE courses. Um, we currently have a skills framework at Linlithgow Academy, um, which we've got on the right. Um, we developed that before the publication of Skills 4.0, so what we're going to look to do is go back and kind of amalgamate what we've got already with some of the stuff from Skills 4.0 and tie it in, jump back it's like tie it in with some of these um, activities that the pupils are the pupils are completing for their um, their formative assessments. Um, an example of one of them, um, just kind of let them power a light bulb. It's the I think out of the six, it's probably my favourite um, formative assessment. It's one of the only experiments I can think of where you can literally give the kids a tray of stuff and tell them go wild with it. Um, there's very little damage they can do with lemons and bits of metal, but the idea is they have to they have to show up, show off their knowledge. They have to get um, a light bulb um, to work by creating their own cell, and then at the end they put their knowledge together on a, a poster that we collect. And obviously the two there are from uh, a couple of very able pupils, um, but the the kind of sections that they've got split up into that's the kind of the outcomes that are in the canalium and power light bulb topic, you've got the periodic table and elements, compounds, circuits, and electrochemical cells. So I know maybe it seems like, or one of the things that's quite concerning about doing the formative and summative assessments is the amount of, um, the amount of marking, obviously teacher workloads are massive issue. Um, one thing that we found during lockdown that really, really helps with this, if you are thinking, this is something you're going to take away and perhaps introduce into your school. Um, one of the things that we found is that the um, the marking of it doesn't have to be as onerous as it sounds. Um, there's a very useful uh, kind of facility in Teams, which you might already know about this, and apologies if this is preaching, um, but you can basically create a rubric, um, one of which is up on the board now for our living on our planet topic. Um, the pupils can upload what they've worked on, 
and to mark them down the right hand side you can see that is the kind of standards with the success criteria for each level gold silver and bronze that we've put together as a faculty it makes it very 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 quick to mark um the pupils obviously get instant feedback on it but it's something that again it's not a case of we're having to mark two assessments here this one is it's very very easy to mark as long as you've got that kind of prior discussion and the rubric put together and um, the last wee bit i wanted to mention just for a just for a second is the monitoring tracking that we've got in the in the bg currently we're using a uh, did book um and i mean that's <laughs> at the moment that's kind of really it um what we're looking to develop over the next couple of years we've got a lot of really good stuff in the senior phase that we use in the faculty um, we're looking to try and kind of amalgamate that with uh, Didbook and things in the BGE. We're a very kind of data-driven department. Um, staff here are confident using data, uh, and it's something we're going to look to develop. But as before, we've not really had an opportunity to deliver any of the courses in their entirety because of COVID. Um, but that's certainly something that if you are kind of interested in, you know, maybe putting together some kind of group following this, talking about monitoring tracking, it's something that we'd be very, very keen to, to hear from you about what you do for your BGE courses. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to hand you over to uh, my colleague, Louisa. Hi, I'm going to be really quick because I know that we're out of time. I think a lot of you have got questions. Um, next steps, we have been developing this course over the last six years, 2016. Um, we've never actually delivered the S2 course in its entirety because the last two years have been impacted by COVID. So um, we're continually updating and improving. We're looking at our level four courses, again, mixing our skills and content. We are finalising our S3 courses because they were supposed to be finalised last year. So we'll just I'll leave the S3 outcomes up there for you to have a look at. They are being taught as discrete chemistry, physics and biology, and the kids have opted into them. So they are recoursed at the end of third year for end of second year for third year, and then they're recoursed at the end of third year for fourth year. Uh, we did have a really good uptake from S2 into S3 this year. So things are obviously moving in the right direction, and we're hoping that that will continue with an uptake from S3 into S4 this year. So I don't need to read all the topics. You can have a look at slides when you've got time. Um, our next stage really is constant review and development. Every time we do it, somebody finds a better video or a better image or a better clip. And because everything is set up as PowerPoints and set up as live documents that we're sharing through our faculty team, we are able to update and keep things fresh and new. Um, we're continually looking for depth and challenge, looking for extension activities, looking for things that don't involve the kids having to write even more. So sending them articles, using our class teams to give them extra news articles to read, extra things to keep them engaged. And obviously, as national priorities change, we have to keep being flexible. And that's the, the thing about our courses. It has been incredibly flexible. Um, we, we didn't go down the booklet model so that we could keep changing, keep adapting. Um, Andy earlier alluded to skills 4.0. Um, obviously, there's the... Um, equity agenda and getting the workforce in. We've been looking recently at things from the INSC, from the IOP, from the Pharmaceutical Association, from the IOP, just using all the professional bodies and all the materials that they're developing to embed those careers, slides, information, images in each lesson as we go, rather than trying to bolt it on at the end. So it's slowly coming together. I'm going to stop there so that we've got time for questions. Okay, everyone. Now, um, sorry, I'm very aware that um, we have a good time now. That I have, we have been answering um, questions on the Padlet as they've been coming in, but I'm also aware, um, and maybe if I want to kind of hand over to Ian um, and Jenny, because there are a couple of slides at the end here. Um, now, uh, on the on slides here, we have some contacts. We have all the Twitter handles for the sciences. Um, across the academy, also the actual academy Twitter, but there's also two emails there for myself and David. Now, um, Ian, I don't know if you want to maybe take over at the moment just to talk a wee bit about the reflection and the last slide. Is that okay? That's great. Yes, That's great. we will. Yeah. Great. Um, thanks very much. So, um, 
we'd be very grateful to everyone on the call tonight if you can complete the webinar. As I say, this was this, uh, the first of, of hopefully, you know, a, a series of sessions around the BGE where we can come together and share practice and reflect. So we're really keen to, to get any feedback from you. Uh, you know, what was useful, what could we do better next time? I know the, the staff in Lithgow would be very, very keen on, on, on honest feedback as well. They'll use that for their own uh, professional development. So please, um, please do complete that evaluation. And there's some, you know, you know, what touched your head, you know, what, you know, something that made you think, you know, what would you maybe leave out next time? Uh, what's something that really sort of struck you uh, or will stay with you from the session today? Uh, and what's something you will you will remember and take away with you. So there's maybe some suggestions of things you can include or take into that evaluation. And Janie's just popped a link into uh, the chat as well. Um, Janie, anything else I've forgotten about? Okay, so the STEM Annual Practitioner Surveys. These are really important surveys to us. We, we send these out every year and they help us to track the progress we're making in improving professional learning for yourselves and other STEM teachers all across Scotland. They give us enormously valuable data. We share this with uh, anonymised data. We share it with STEM partners all over across Scotland so we can help them be very clear about your priorities and what your needs are and also where the gaps are in terms of professional learning provision. So the surveys for this year are now live. Uh, we've attached a survey for practitioners in early learning, primary, ASN and secondary. And we've got the link there and we'll put them into the chat as well. And there's also one for school-based technical support staff because we know how important uh, their work is and their support is uh, to improve outcomes for learners across Scotland. So we're very keen to meet their professional learning needs as well. And we'd be grateful if you can promote that to your technicians uh, too. So you've got up until the 20th of December to complete those surveys and we'd be grateful for your help you know, and circulating them around your department and trying to get as many responses as we can, because that gives us more valid data, as you know. So, uh, and also, if you're interested in the, the data from previous years, please take a look at our STEM summary page on the National Improvement Hub. Uh, that data has really deeply informed our decisions about the STEM grant programme, where we've allocated over eight, uh, sorry, three million pounds over the last few years. So we really do take that data on board and, and we, we do make decisions accordingly. So big thanks for any help.